Good morning. My name is Margaret and I'd like to share a few thoughts with you this morning from God's Word. But I'd like to ask a question first. Have you ever um, been reading your Bible and you've come across something that you know you've read it before, but there's something that you missed, something that jumps out at you and you think, well, I, I don't remember seeing that. Well, that happened to me a few weeks ago. I was reading the book of Ezra and just to give you a bit of context, I'm just going to read a few verses from the, the first chapter. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation. And this is what the proclamation was. The Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord. So the children of Israel were into exile and now God has opened the way for them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Then I got to chapter 3, and this is what I read in verse 3. Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and the evening sacrifice. And I just thought that was a bit strange, because they'd gone back to build a temple, and yet they'd just built the foundation and an altar and began to offer sacrifices. And I was just a bit um, puzzled by this. But I do actually have a little book that is, um, it's a study book on Ezra and Nehemiah. And so I had a look in that book. And this is what the author says about restoring um, the temple. And he said, um, when the time of chastening ended and the Lord set out to re-establish his covenant people in the land he had promised them, he did not begin by restoring and renewing their political establishment. His first priority was not renewing and restoring their economy. It was not restoring and renewing education, housing or transportation. The sovereign God restored and renewed the worship of his people at this first stage of re-establishing them as a nation. So he was saying here that God's priority was not actually the temple, God's priority was worship. And that got me thinking a little bit about how we live our lives today, because often we think of worship as praise and worship when we're actually in a church and in a service. But worship is much, much more than that. Hosea chapter 6 uh, verse 6 says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Micah chapter 6 again verse 8, he has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So the Bible seems to be saying that worship is much, much more than what we do in our services together, though they are very valid and, and, and wonderful times. But worship is much, much more. Worship is a frame of mind, an attitude of heart to surrender everything, everything that we are to the Lordship of Jesus. I was reminded of the um, story of the widow's might when people were going into the temple, great crowds of people were going into the temple and they were throwing their offering into the, the receptacle there uh, to receive them. And um, some were throwing in a great deal of money and making a spectacle of it. And Jesus points to um, a widow who walked in and without any ceremony and without any display, she puts in two copper coins and Jesus says that of all the people who went in she put in the most because she put in everything that she had that was an act of worship on her behalf giving everything to God 
And every time we say a kind word, every time we do a kind act on behalf or in the name of the Lord, that is an act of worship. Every time we forgive an offence because of Jesus' sacrifice and his obedience, our obedience to him, that is an act of worship. So worship can be a great thing. Worship can be a very small thing. What matters is the attitude of our hearts, that we come with a heart that is surrendered to God, that says, God, here I am. Take me, use me, make me what you want me to be and help me just to surrender everything I am to you. If we go back to this little book that I was reading from before, following on from what he's just said, the author says, whenever our lives feel ineffective or stale, whenever we have experienced the chastening of the Lord, whenever we want to reach a greater, a greater intimacy with our Lord, the first priority must be the rebuilding or strengthening our worship of the living God. The Holy Spirit makes his dwelling and his base of operation in our hearts given to worship. And, you know, we've been through some really rough times over this uh, last year. And there are signs of hope on the horizon, but we just don't know where things are going to go. But if we will centre our hearts upon Jesus, if we will centre our minds upon God, if we will walk in an attitude of worship, then he, will, he is faithful. He will provide everything that we're going to need for the months ahead, everything that we're going to need to sustain us and to uphold us. He is faithful. Let's worship him. Father, I just want to thank you that you are a faithful God and that you desire a relationship with us that is close, that is intimate and that is full of worship. And I pray, Father, that you will just bless us in the days ahead as we seek your face to know more and more what it means to worship you, our Heavenly Father, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Have a blessed day, everyone.